Okay, I thought I will give you a table essentially providing the details of helicopter control for different configurations. That means, you can have a single main rotor and one tail rotor. You have coaxial, you have tandem and you have side by side. Okay. Now, the controls slightly differ depending on what configuration of the helicopter we are uh, addressing. Okay. Here you see height that is for vertical moving up and down, all are controlled by the main rotor collective. Okay. Everything has main rotor collective. Even if you have two rotors coaxial, see all these are two horizontal rotors, but again collective means you saw that the pitch angle changes uniformly over all the blades at every azimuth location. Whereas, when you take uh, longitudinal that means pitch, you will find main rotor cyclic coaxial has main rotor cyclic, but when you have tandem that means one rotor behind the other, I can have a differential collective that means one side I increase the collective other one I reduce. So, there is a pitching moment generated. So, the nature of control can be Okay. I increase the collective here means I increase the thrust here compared to this automatically I will give you a pitch. So, that is called the differential collective, okay. main rotor differential collective. If you take side by side then you have main rotor cyclic because for pitch you have two rotors. So, if you want to go down you have to give a cyclic control, okay. but when you go to lateral for different configuration again this is main rotor cyclic for the single rotor, coaxial again main rotor cyclic, tandem cyclic now because you want to roll whereas side by side you see differential collective because I can increase it, I can decrease it, so I can roll. Now, when you go to the yaw moment for the single main rotor tail rotor, tail rotor collective that means, you operate the pedal coaxial differential collective that means, each rotor gets different pitch angle. Okay. As a result, there is a torque generated and if you take tandem yeah, differential cyclic that means, this rotor you tilt one side other rotor you tilt then you can rotate okay. and side by side also differential cyclic. Okay. Now, of course, the torque balance is given here tail rotor thrust gives the torque balance for single main rotor coaxial that is the differential torque of the two rotors tandem again main rotor differential torque side by side differential torque. So, if you look at it the control using the two rotors they are little different for different different configurations, but as far as the pilot is concerned he will have one stick one collective stick and pedal. Now, depending on the configuration you have to make sure that when he moves the pedal he does the appropriate change in the either tail rotor or he has to <laughs> change differential collective. It is not that he is given a some other control lever. Okay. That is why in the helicopter configuration is important and how this various forces and moments are generated by 
essentially using the rotors okay and that's why they call i put a star here just to indicate this is called combined pitch differential control mechanism which goes to the main rotor okay this is a kind of a different terminology and now when we analyze in this course we always take this okay pretty much the configuration is a single main rotor single tail rotor and most of the books everything they deal with this only because if you understand the basics of this then rest of the things are fairly easy only thing is you have to know what to do as far as the rotor behavior is concerned you have thoroughly understood and then whether you put two rotors or one horizontal and one vertical that depends on the type of configuration okay and next is uh, uh, this is a preliminary thing about the power required for uh, helicopters which you will be calculating this is just an introduction i am giving for you to see because helicopters have to hover and they have to fly forward now what happens to the power required okay generally the power required are classified into three major factors you can call it one is called the induced power another one is the profile power and third is parasite power now what is the meaning of each one of them is induced power essentially represent you want to lift the helicopter okay the power required to lift the helicopter that's called induced power we will be calculating all these things because that is that will become part of your assignment also the profile power is essentially you are dragging the blade in air okay so there is a drag force on the blade and the power required to drag the blade is the profile power now the other one is which is the parasite when you are going forward flight you have to drag the helicopter okay so helicopter means helicopter and the hub etc and that is the parasite power so please understand it is not the profile blade also gets dragged in the air and the fuselage is also getting dragged in the air so in hover this is the x axis is forward speed this is the power given in hertz power don't bother about the numbers you look at the trend in the curve trend that is very very critical you see induced power initially it is very high in hover and then with increase in forward speed induced power slowly decreases whereas the profile power which is the blade drag which is the drag for cd cd not you may call it which up to some speed it doesn't vary much after that it shows a slow variation that is purely aerofoil characteristic that is the profile power but if you look at the parasite it is zero because you are not dragging the fuselage in hover you are not moving forward so it's fine it is zero but then as you keep increasing the forward speed this starts going up and it goes in a cubic variation of velocity please understand the parasite drag will be proportional to v cube that power drag is proportional to v square power is v cube so you see if you sum up all because these are the major power required because in any helicopter design they have to calculate all this stuff you see the power curve the total it's high in hover it decreases with forward speed and then it starts increasing okay so this is your nature of the power versus velocity curve so it decreases and then it will increase 
and it will increase you see the slope of this it is very sharp and uh, when you want to fly very high speed you have to have tremendous power and it is going to be velocity cube. So, any increase in speed power required goes by v cube and when you select the helicopter or when you select the engine for a particular helicopter the operation we have to consider and what is the power available in the engine, how much power is required for a specific flight condition. Now, you know that as you go high altitude there is a variation in density that will affect the engine power that will also affect this because the density varies you will see when I derive the whole thing after this you will see density is going to influence tremendously. So, that is why the power curve is very very critical when you are talking about helicopters and this also tells you are not going to fly just horizontally you want to climb. If you want to climb you need to have extra power otherwise you cannot climb because if you are hovering I have this much power. Now, if the power available is exactly like this then you cannot climb. So, they will say what is the power available now you see if I draw a curve this is power versus velocity goes like this if power available if I take it this this is P power available you can only fly up to that speed you cannot fly beyond that speed ok and if you are at this speed you cannot even climb up. So, these are all restrictions which come because of the nature of your power required these are all the major major components of power then you may ask what are the other components there are certain rotor inflow interferes with the fuselage ok then tail rotor you need to have some power then there are power losses because the engine may rotate at a higher rpm you put some gears then there is a power loss in the gears ok and there are tip losses there are swirl effects there are several types of that is why I have written for a hover what are the other losses typically it is just for uh, various types of because the inflow can be not a uniform inflow you will understand what uniform inflow means later then swirl then tip loss engine transmission tail rotor rotor fuselage these are all not easy to estimate it is very difficult because you have to do a actual flight internal test and uh, other uh, today CFD people are trying to do uh, that is still a you know long way to go. So, you have other losses also these are just the estimates. So, your engine has to have sufficient power if you want to fly the helicopter, but one interesting point which I will briefly tell you there is something called a ground effect ok. We will learn later there is something called a ground effect ok. When the rotor is operating very close to the ground very close means how close you may ask you can take it as a one rotor diameter less than one rotor diameter one rotor diameter when it is operating very close to the ground the ground provides some kind of a cushioning effect ok. As a result to lift the same weight if you are out of ground they call it O G E or I G E out of ground effect that means ground is not there this is in ground effect if the ground is near basically the power because of the cushioning effect the power to lift the same weight slightly reduces as a result that is why you can hover the helicopter near the ground, but you may not be able to hover the helicopter above the ground 
sometimes we want to carry a little extra weight. What they do is, it is interesting, you see when I increase my forward speed, my power required decreases. That means, you can give a ground run or if there is a wind, you try to take off into the wind direction, even with a slightly heavier weight. So, these are all the operational things which pilots use it when they want to take off. And now, this particular curve is used what is the best speed for maximum range? Uh, this we will study that later, that is one question. Another one is what is the best speed for maximum climb rate? Okay. These are important things, we will learn about that from this curve as we progress in the uh, course. Okay. Now, with this pretty much the introduction to the helicopter is over. Now, we start with uh, the first topic which we consider is the hovering theory. What do you mean by hover? Key is hover means the helicopter is rotor we consider rotor because the fuselage is just a weight. Helicopter is stationary and with respect to the wind outside some slip stream, there is something called a. So, you take this is my rotor. And you say this is an idealization, please understand. You draw some something like this, this is called slip stream. This that means the air inside this region only is affected. Outside this region, air is stationary. Okay, and the rotor is stationary with respect to that so, and it is a still air, because you can have the effect of forward flight even though the helicopter may be hovering with respect to the ground, please not, with respect to the ground you are fine, because you do not move, but if a wind is flowing then it is equivalent to a forward flight, okay. then the pilot has to keep controlling. Here when we talk about hover theory, the air outside the slip stream is stationary and the rotor is stationary, but within this the flow is affected. Okay. This is the condition for hover, where did this theory start? So, there is a brief history, it was uh, by marine propellers it was started basically the momentum theory. Okay. Momentum theory, I will briefly tell you what that. The hover theory was originally by Rankine for marine propellers in 1865. Later modifications were made and 1920 okay, there were some rotational effects, the swirl effects were considered, but this is momentum theory, please understand 1865 then Froud 1885. Okay. And then Cates 1920 and this is uh, Rankine, I think 1865, basically proposed he added some swirl effects later. This is all this for just marine propellers, not for a helicopter. 
Now, what is the basis of this momentum theory? It purely the physics which is conservation loss, conservation of mass, okay. conservation of mass, conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, incompressible flow treated incompressible. Okay. And these are the basic three because fluid mechanics you have mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation that is all using this they came up with the theory for a this is called the momentum theory, but it is very very global because what is that it assumes you have a rotor, rotor means rotor has a blades marine propeller also has some blades, aircraft propeller has blades and your helicopter rotor has blades. But what is the assumption that is made in this particular theory? You say this is a new word, rotor is treated as a actuator disc, actuator disc means it is a thin circular disc with the radius as the rotor radius and it has infinite number of blades, okay, that is assumed, infinite number of blades, but that does not mean it is solid and it is permeable to the flow, rotor flow can go through the disc, but it supports a pressure difference. Okay. So, this is a assumption, actuator disc is simply now it is an area that is why I have drawn this line this is a rotor that is one line that is all with the, the diameter of the rotor. And it is permeable to the flow that means flow can go through this. Okay. That is the basic first assumption F flow can go through this, but it supports a pressure difference. So, you have a top surface, you have a bottom surface, there is a pressure differential, but the velocity is or the flow velocity is continuous. This is like it looks a little you know you cannot immediately visualize what is really going on. That is why this theory is based on the basic laws of physics and it makes a lot of assumptions. But please understand it does not consider details of blade, operating conditions, nothing. It does not require anything, it just requires what is the rotor diameter that is all. Plus, if you say this is my rotor diameter, okay, I can get some basic quantities, okay. that is what the momentum theory. So, this theory is important, but this alone is not sufficient because it does not matter what kind of a blade, what is your aerofoil, what is the rpm it is rotating, what is the pitch angle you are operating nothing. Okay. Now, then you will say what is this theory, where is it used, is it really useful is the basic question that will come up. Okay. Yes, it is useful in getting some preliminary estimates. Okay. Now, let us see how the momentum theory is formulated. Okay. So, this is the that is why I said slipstream, this is the boundary. You may assume that it is like a it is not exactly like a wind tunnel, please understand wind tunnel is a closed, here it is not closed. This is like a demarcation this line between air outside and air inside. Okay. Now, the very first assumption I am going to make though I have written here, later you will mathematically you can show this particular thing. I assume uniform inflow, now I have used a new terminology which is called the inflow, inflow is this is uh, 
okay, in flow. This is a terminology in helicopters, but we are interested in the flow velocity at the rotor disc normal to it. Okay, that is important. It is the velocity normal. Okay, and uh, we use a symbol, and I put uniform inflow. Uniform inflow means the velocity everywhere is same. Okay, that means I am assuming it's a uniform inflow. You may ask, how do you know? What do you know? Or you take it. That is a starting point. Later, you start really going deeper into that. So, very first thing is you assume uniform inflow and the flow velocity if it is hovering here it is 0, this is far field and the pressure is p infinity, p infinity or p naught or whatever you may call it and then just above that p 1, just below this pressure 2 and far field downstream p infinity, but I say here it is some velocity is coming that means it is going out here. So, I will put velocity here this I call it w and here I use the symbol nu, okay. this is a standard symbol which is used in uh, helicopters. Okay. So, these symbols which I am using are all what is used in wherever you go inflow they use the symbol nu. Now, this is my basic assumption of momentum theory in hover please understand it is in hover only. Okay. Now, I have used the something I wrote uniform inflow and within bracket I put minimum induced power. Okay. Mathematically, you can show this is like calculus of variation I am telling you. Using calculus of variation, you have a thrust. Now, I use the word thrust. Thrust is this rotor is supporting a weight. So, I call that is the thrust T. The thrust is here I take perpendicular to the rotor disc that is like the rotor is really pushing the air down continuously. Okay. As a result Newton's law you push something you get a upward force. So, the rotor gets the thrust upwards and the rotor is pushing the air down. So, this is the momentum theory. So, this thrust, but for it to push the air down you need some power okay. and that power is called the induced power. Okay. The power to lift the weight that is all nothing more that is why it is the induced you can say inflow or sometimes you say induced velocity. Okay. Induced, induced velocity. In forward flight, we use it. Right now, you say inflow is enough. Okay. Now, you will find if I have uniform inflow, then I will have minimum induced power. That is the last means because you have to supply that much power at least. Okay, but that is not sufficient. This is the ideal condition. But mathematically, you can show because that I will give you later once we get the equation I will say this is the problem. Now, you say using calculus of variation you will say that yes, if you have this condition satisfied you will have minimum induced power. For minimum induced power you want uniform inflow that is the key. Okay. Now, you may start worrying how do I achieve uniform inflow that is a different thing you follow. I assume uniform inflow 
if it is uniform inflow in hover, everything is hover, please understand, I get a minimum induced power, good. Now, how do I achieve uniform inflow? That is the next question. So, we will come to that part later. So, now we will see the momentum theory starting from basics. This is the basic stuff. So, here okay, I use the slightly different symbol. Okay. You can look at the diagram. Okay. This I call it station 0, that means far field upstream, and the velocity is 0 there. Now, as you come near the rotor disk. I call it the flow at the rotor disk is new okay. and it is constant over the disk and the disk area is pi r square because r is the radius. Now, I put station 1 and 2 because 1 is above just above, above the rotor disk, 2 is just below the rotor disk and then station 3 which is far field downstream that is here which I call it W okay. and now this is like a tunnel okay. because the velocity is 0 here as you, you know, let us just simple you see mass flow rate when the velocity increases actually the area is reducing that is all because the same mass has to flow. Now, if you look at the mass flow rate that means the amount of air that is flowing through the slip stream. You have only two quantities, one is W, another one is nu, but the area you only know one area that is the rotor disk area because you do not know what is the area here, okay, the cross sectional area that means the mass flow rate that means density into area into velocity, velocity at that area that is all. So, that is rho a nu m dot. Now, momentum conservation, momentum conservation is basically Newton's second law, okay. rate of change of momentum is basically the force applied. Now, what is the momentum change to the flow per second? Far field here the velocity is 0, okay. so 0 momentum and here the velocity is w and how much is the change in rate of change of momentum is m dot into w minus 0 that is the rate at which momentum is changed m dot w okay. and that is the force, but that force is acting on the rotor disk because that is the one which is creating that. Okay. Now, you substitute for m dot this value rho a nu w that is all t. Now, the next part is energy conservation that is the power you supplied, there is no loss in this, the power you supply is basically goes towards changing the kinetic energy of the flow. Now, what is the change in kinetic energy? Half, so I will write change in kinetic energy is per second, everything is per second. Okay because here velocity is 0, here velocity is w. So, you will have half m dot w square okay. and m dot is rho a nu half 
rho a nu w square. This is the change in kinetic energy and the power is actually force into velocity and the force is acting on the rotor disc and the velocity at that disc is nu. So, the power is T nu okay. and thrust is given here from momentum conservation rho a nu w. So, you can write it here substitute you will have rho a nu w into nu is half rho a nu w square. So, you will find you cancel out rho a nu 1 w you cancel. So, you will get w becomes 2 nu this is the basis that means the far field velocity in the slip stream is twice the velocity at the rotor disc. So, you got a relation between w and nu. Now, simply go back substitute for what is w? w is 2 nu. So, your thrust is given by rho a nu 2 nu. Okay. So, you have now a nice expression for thrust. So, this is what thrust produced is into 2 nu or you can write it as 2 rho a nu square. And the power is induced power that is why I say this power is only induced because you are inducing that velocity that is why we call it induced power if you want you can use the symbol I n d this is thrust into nu and you know thrust is here you can write the full expression or you want in terms of nu you can write it because here because this leaves you what t by 2 rho a this is there and t by 2 rho a. So, that is all nothing more it cannot give you anything of course, you can draw the velocity profile etcetera that we will sorry the pressure profile. Now, this essentially gives me very simple relationship thrust is basically weight of the helicopter because the rotor disc is given by rotor disc area and density of air is known to you. Now, you say hey what should be the engine selection of engine minimum it says what is the weight you want to lift in hover thrust is equal to weight okay. and thrust into square root of thrust divided by 2 rho a all right. Now, if your rotor disc area is less this quantity is more that means, your inflow is more and you can get an estimate of the what is the power. Now, if you say if you want to reduce the power you try to increase the rotor area. Now, you see as the, it is directly rotor area dependent, but does it mean that you can you increase keep on increasing. Now, there are other practical consideration it will come later, but the essential part is yes and of course, density. Now, it immediately tells you if I want to fly the helicopter fly means hover the helicopter at an altitude which is about 19,000 feet 
the density of air drops by half that means the power required is going to increase okay so you can't operate the helicopter at any height because the power required to hover actually increases with altitude but the engine power actually will decrease with altitude because the density is less so you find it will be an interesting that is this is the power this is with altitude you will find the induced power will go it will increase this is the p induced but the engine power may decrease this is engine power that is all that is the altitude you can just barely. So, selection of engine, engine characteristic is very very important it is not that I will go and buy any engine. So, you will find usually see India has to operate helicopters at a much higher altitude. Okay. There are several helicopters in the Europe I do not think Europe, US they do not need to operate at that height. Okay. So, usually when it comes they want to sell a product it is always a problem because you will find that India will immediately all the you know of course, the services they have requirement of high altitude they have requirement of desert which is Rajasthan and they have sea water because the corrosion you have a variety of conditions atmospheric conditions. So, you will find the whatever somebody says oh this will fly you may buy, but you will not be able to operate that. So, these are very very critical when you want to procure and that is why when I say when people are making about I will make a flying car flying car with four rotors I put it I will lift it. Please understand the first thing you calculate is a hey, what is the at least the power I need to lift that particular car whether you put one rotor four rotors any rotor this is the ideal bare minimum there are other things because this is does not take into account all the losses and other things. If you do not have this you will never be able to fly. Okay that is why the primary thing this momentum theory gives some idea of power thrust density rotor area this relationship okay very very in the most primitive fashion but these are performance numbers okay so if somebody says that i'm going to make a helicopter okay with this rotor this is the engine uh, suppose somebody gives you a scooter engine okay you fly but you have to check what power it gives what is its weight and then what is the rotor you are putting very very simplistic calculation very simple calculation that is why momentum theory is gives you the first cut okay and uh, as you become more and more uh, experienced and become an expert in the field you will immediately have all these numbers quickly you calculate you will say this is meaningless that is why all these things are very very critical. Now, so you you now see induced power divided by thrust okay. that is P over T see induced power P induced by thrust this is nothing but new okay now it immediately tells you if you are power required is less you want to have less power increase uh, sorry decrease induced velocity how do you decrease induced velocity go and increase the disk area okay so, they will say okay, let us have a increase the rotor size reduce, but of course, it is from a hovering point of view because the helicopter the key is you should be able to hover 
if you cannot hover it is no longer a helicopter okay that is the special flight feature of the helicopter okay so hover is always considered because moment you start flying forward the power required is less than hover but of course if you try to increase high speed then you will find that power will again come and then hit the hover power okay so this gives you an expression for induced velocity to thrust is new and actually there are two terminologies which i will say power loading and disk loading okay power loading and power loading is actually t over p one over inflow this is the thrust over power power loading okay and another terminology is disk loading this is t over a okay these are two terminology disk loading now because the t over a is always assuming density is constant you take the sea level or anything now why helicopter is a better vehicle for in terms of hover performance what is so special because you can also that is why now the disk loading for helicopters is usually please understand is usually in the range of 100 to 500 newton per meter square okay and the corresponding inflow basically i took the same value i took the sea level density you will find the inflow velocity is in the range of 6.4 to 6 to 14 meter per second okay this you can calculate because this is the square root of t over 2 rho a now i am just giving here a comparison of various vehicles which have the hovering capability this is a helicopter rotor t over a i am giving propeller you can tell the propeller okay but in the propeller t over a is of the order of 25 100 this is 100 to 500 if you go to ducted fan because there are several types of models okay that is of the order of 5000 to 25000 now you know that jet that is the sea harrier there is an aircraft which is a jet will come and then hit the ground and it will it can hover the jet is actually coming out and there the in t over a is of the order of 50000 newton per meter square okay that also has a hover capability helicopter rotor is also having a rotor capability okay now if you go to that high value the power required is phenomenal whereas helicopters require less power that is the advantage so the helicopters require less power to hover usually the sea harrier what sometimes you may see in the video that is shown only for video pilot does not hover it is only to demonstrate that it has a hovering capability because i talked to some pilot they said that if we hover all our fuel is gone before we take off because it it is just for yes that particular aircraft has this capability because it is operational on a ship okay it can come and but it will is it the fuel will just go off where well, you don't try to operate on that so that is where the key is helicopter rotor that is why helicopters are still popular with all the problems with various other reasons because it 
has less power for hovering. Okay. And now, we will use certain uh, just some numbers because this is for helicopter rotor has lowest disc loading. So, best hover performance that is the reason helicopters are still and of course, it can land take off from any terrain all those things are there and then the power of course, it depends on density of air. So, that is important and uh, this is I have given some helicopters which India has produced that is the ALH which is advanced light helicopter. I am giving what is the disc loading for that helicopter okay. because this is just to because there I have written generally it is in the range of 100 to 500 etcetera. Now, if you look at various helicopters you will slowly understand that it is in the range this is about 4000 and uh, T into 9.81 and the radius is 6.6 .6 meter. Okay, now, you get an idea of what is the rotor radius. Okay. Please understand helicopter rotors are of the radius of about 20, 22 of that feet 25 feet, but one helicopter that is why I have written here me 26. Okay. This is you see radius is 16 meters at more than 50 feet, okay. it is a huge it looks like a real big elephant, okay. it has a 8 blades I think and uh, that. So, this is just for comparison I am saying even though this is also a single main rotor tail rotor this is also a single main rotor tail rotor, but the weight comparison if you look at it this you divide by 10 this is about 40. 45,000 kg, okay. 45,000 this is 4,000 this is about 10 times more, okay. but even then when you look at the non-dimensional numbers they are all in the helicopter range. That is why sometimes all these numbers thrust if you simply say it may not give you a clear picture but T over A which is the disc loading that if you compare for different helicopters then you will say hey, they are of the within the zone whereas thrust you may have a helicopter with uh, 1500 or 1800 kg 3000 kg 5000 kg 10000 45000 okay various actually this is the heaviest very heavy helicopter single rotor this is a Russian Mi 26. Okay. Now, you can see approximately all of them will have the disc loading is in the range of 100 to 500 the 12 to 1 time. Okay. Now, let us define some non dimensional quantities because these are going to be very useful we will be dealing with non dimensional quantities. The first quantity is inflow ratio please understand this is very important and the symbol used is lambda. Okay. Inflow ratio lambda is nu over omega r please understand omega r is tip speed. Okay. omega I may give in rpm, but please understand radian per second you have to take it and then calculate the tip speed. Okay. This is the inflow sometimes people do not use the word inflow ratio they will simply say inflow. Okay. So, please understand inflow even if I mention I do not have to give you in meter per second it can be a non dimensional number. So, you have to know that these are quantities which are very very uh, important and they will be used throughout the semester. And then 
now you see thrust coefficient. So, in the aircraft terminology thrust is something which is taking you forward whereas, in the helicopter terminology thrust is actually that which supports the weight. Okay. So, there is a big difference between aircraft and helicopter terminology. So, thrust coefficient and the symbol used is C t, C sub t which is thrust divided by density rotor area which is pi r square and then omega r whole square. This is the thrust coefficient okay. and now the relation between lambda and C t you can get it directly from here. Okay. I, I erase this here. Okay. Because you divide by T over rho pi r square omega r whole square. This is again 2 rho a is basically pi r square that is the rotor area and then nu square over rho pi r square omega r whole square. This you see this is nothing but C t this is 2 lambda square or in other words lambda is square root of C t over 2. Okay. Simple. So, inflow is and C t if you look at it C t for helicopters is usually in the range of this. So, 004 to 006 if you give a slightly suppose you say my C t is 0 0.01 or 0 0.2 that means it is not a helicopter. Okay. So, that is how people immediately the good designers good people who are very good understanding they will say that a hey, C t it has to be in this range if you <laughs> say that mine is a helicopter. Otherwise, just by giving a thrust or area or anything it is difficult. So, either disc loading you specify or C t you specify and you will find in the industry in the publications C t is very commonly used, okay. very commonly used thrust coefficient because thrust coefficient 0, 0, 005 is okay. usually for a helicopter 0, 0, 005 normally that is why I put 004 to 006 and you take now I say I again took the reference of the advanced light helicopter that is the Indian thing. You see C t this is the weight and density 1.225 please understand again density is important in defining C t you may say hey what is that uh, this is always like this means if I go to high altitude what happens. Yes, of course, C t will go up. Now, you automatically see if the thrust coefficient goes up, inflow goes up. If inflow goes up, power goes up for the same rotor. Okay. That is how everything is related. C t for ALH, the rotor radius is 6.6 .6 and the tip speed. Okay. This is around 32.8 radian per second. Okay. It is actually around 300 plus rpm, 317 or something like that, I do not know what is the 3, 300 something okay, rpm. Now, if you multiply these two, you see for the ALH C T for 4000 class this is around 0.00497, but you take some other helicopter it will be around that range. 
even if you increase some weight it will become slightly. You see the tip speed this is omega r 200 17 meter per second. Now, you may be wondering earlier I showed you another rotor with the 16 meter radius, what is the rpm of that, okay? because I did not specify the rpm, there it is much lower, it is around 1 point some hertz, okay? it is very slowly turning. Then what is that really very, very important? in the helicopter rotor, one is the radius, another one is the omega angular velocity. Okay. These are the two parameters, radius you know that if I increase my radius, I require my C T will actually come down, my inflow will come down, my power will come down, everything will come down beautiful. But then if I increase my omega, actually what will happen again that will also reduce my C T, but then if I keep on increasing my omega my tip speed will keep increasing and then you may start getting into adverse effects of the flow because you start having lot of compressibility divergence drag divergence there is something called a drag divergence speed beyond with the drag force will start increasing because your Mach number is increasing. Okay. So, they try to keep the tip speed around 200 meter per second, it may be 180 also. So, you will find most of the helicopters, actually you take any helicopter, the tip speed omega r is in that range. It is not that because you see this is about in the sea level, this is about 0.6 mark because 330 you take it around 0.6. Okay. So, 0.6 mark is the tip speed they keep it, do not try to go very high value. Okay. Of course, you have to fly forward also that comes later. I am talking about all these numbers I introduced in the beginning to indicate the range of numbers which are used. Now, even if I give you any data, anything to you, you will find that it is, it should be within that zone. Okay. Now, 217 meter per second. Now, power coefficient is C p is power divided by rho pi r square omega r whole cube. Okay. This is power coefficient, thrust coefficient, inflow. Okay. These are your non-dimensional basically numbers. Okay. Now, you can relate again C p to C t, because you know power is related to thrust you non dimensionalize it that is what I have written here, you will get power is what T into nu okay. and I am dividing rho pi r square omega r square that is C T and nu by omega r that is lambda, lambda is root of C T by 2. So, C P is C T power 3 by 2 over root 2 power, power coefficient. Okay. So, today you have learnt this basic, uh, basic quantities because this is very, very important okay. and this is all from Hoover theory. Now, there is one more uh, uh, point which is important which is always referred how do you define efficiency okay you know it's a, it's a little bit uh, difficult depending on the situation you may define but in the helicopters there is something called 
figure of merit okay it is denoted by the symbol m and please understand figure of merit is only for brace comparison of few helicopters you should not think that this is the very very important uh, number which should be critical etc because you will find it may vary quite a bit but how it is defined is ideal power that means ideal power is the power required to lift the weight that is the minimum that is no loss nothing that is your induced power induced power is t nu okay but actual power required because you will have losses that is only when you fly the helicopter you will know okay or theoretically when you calculate you can calculate in hover what are the various losses okay and that is the actual power we will learn how to calculate in a simplistic way the actual power as a part of this course that is p actual so this is always less than 1 so the figure of merit is always less than 1 but later you will find just by looking at the figure of merit it may you may have a, uh, you can come to a wrong conclusion that we will see later so a good rotor good means good efficient rotor uh, only from please understand this is defined only for hover not for forward flight figure of merit is if you want to compare two rotors good because you may have a different aerofoil whose drag characteristics can be different so from that point of view yes figure of merit is good so if it is in the range of zeros 0.75 to 0.8 it's a good good rotor but if it is below 0.5 you know it's not that good but you may find some helicopters may be 0 0.6 0.55 but it doesn't mean those helicopters are flying that means it is not that completely inefficient helicopter from a hover point of view if you compare similar rotor helicopter that is where the comparison goes okay you cannot take uh, every helicopter and put them in figure of merit you will find that means you can't throw that because sometimes you design your helicopter for hover capability is there but you also want a little high speed capability okay high speed when you want to go if the rotor diameter is very big you have drag is also more so you want to reduce the rotor diameter but when you reduce the rotor diameter over efficiency basically suffers so you will find depending on the utility of the helicopter the decisions are made about the sizing but typical rotor diameter and rpm please understand these two go in combination tip speed is the critical number okay so you can't say that it will never happen that i will have any rotor radius you can if i put any engine okay i will rotate at a higher rpm no it's not like that. okay and i think this much is the basic uh, level of momentum i'll just briefly make a statement then i'll close today okay in the momentum theory we had only rotor radius rotor radius omega we just introduced only for non dimensionalization okay whereas the momentum theory did not consider any detail about the blade how many blades are there in the rotor system whether it is a three blades two blades four blades eight blades nothing but then that theory is not sufficient because you you don't know what is the rpm it is rotating nothing is known now you realize hey this theory is not of much use to me if i want to really do any calculation any design anything momentum theory is not useful it gives some numbers but that is not useful for me that means i need to have some other theory 
okay, that some other theory is blade element theory okay, B E T because this is a very very important in all rotor analysis. Please understand blade element theory is used everywhere whether research or anything <laughs> we have to use this. Okay. Then you will say what is blade element theory that we will learn, but here please understand this is the fundamental for all analysis. There is a little history to that that I will describe to you blade element theory maybe in the next class. This includes details of rotor operating condition, rotor when I meant what is the airfoil, okay, what is the angle of attack, what is the velocity of the rotor in the sense the operating speed and inflow everything is required and this includes what is the flexibility of my blade please understand because my blade is not rigid that means the structural dynamics. So, you see if I want to use there initially in this course we will have a simplistic analysis. I will just introduce oh you see the complexity how it starts if you start including these effects various effects how the same expression in getting an angle of attack. Now, I use the word angle of attack earlier we said pitch angle, pitch angle is what pilot gives, but what each typical section of the rotor blade acts because from aerodynamics you learn okay, I have an aerofoil it is kept in a oncoming flow at a particular angle of attack then I get the lift drag moment and that is the finer details and what type of aerofoil I am having because that changes your nature of the lift drag moment curve and what Mach number I am operating. So, you find all those details are included in the blade element theory, but blade element theory by itself is not good because you need some information about see it is like a fan is rotating flow is coming normal to the rotor disc that is the induced flow right. Now, who is going to give me induced flow because if I do not know the induced flow I will not know the angle of attack properly. Okay. Now, you see I need an inflow to properly define my angle of attack of a typical section of the aerofoil blade element theory requires all the details, but then I need one quantity which blade element theory will not give, but it requires. Okay. This is where now I will we'll start in the next class, how this was the gap was bridged. Now, you see how this complexity of the rotor analysis starts. Okay.